This is the fourth video in a series about what it would take to add a floppy drive to an early Altair. Back in the day before MITS or any other manufacturers were offering, offering floppy disk systems for these early computers. Now our motivation for doing this is to integrate a floppy drive with the MITS programming system. This is an early software development environment for writing assembly language code back in the days when the only mass storage was paper tape or cassette. And as you can imagine, and as we've shown in other videos, trying to edit and assemble files, debug them in an environment with uh, paper tape and cassette for mass storage is just miserable. If you're trying to do any sort of serious software development, it's just completely unworkable. Our goal is to do some commercial software development, and we bought this Altair in order to use it as that platform. But without a floppy drive, it's just not going to work. So we're taking it upon ourselves to add that floppy drive and make this Altair a good development system. Now in the last video, we made some extremely quick and very promising headway by just simply adding the ability to save our 16K of RAM out to disk and then load it back in whenever we needed to. Essentially saving and loading a workspace. Um, and I've used that now over the last week since that last video developing the new features that I'm gonna show you today. And it's a very workable solution, in fact, I like it so much that I think the final answer will be workspace based as opposed to trying to integrate into the, the byte stream oriented file IO that the programming system did originally. That'll just be a secondary feature or maybe not even required at all. But anyway, so we're going to fire this up here in just a minute and go ahead and show you where I've taken this since the last video. Pretty much have the workspace concept fleshed out like I want to see it in the end. So we'll go ahead and do a video cut and get that going. So in this computer, we still have the same problem that we developed in the last video. This has the I.O. routines that allow us to load and save workspaces and of course to boot it. All we have to do is examine that prom at F800 and hit run. In a couple seconds, we're up here and running and we have our prompt from the programming system. So much better than the 10 minutes that we used to endure with a cassette. All right, so what updates do we need to do? Well, obviously the biggest problem we have with what we did last week is that we're only saving one workspace to the disk. Of course, that's a huge waste. We could save a bunch of workspaces to the disk. So we need to add the ability to say where on the disk to put the workspace and where to load it. So that's the main difference in the code we're gonna be looking at today. The other thing I've changed is the hardware. Um, as I developed that code last week, generating less than 200 hex bytes, I was running into the 16K RAM limit. So as a businessman wanting to make a good development system out of this computer, I've sprung for another MIT 16K board to give me a total of 32K. That'll give us a lot more headroom for developing bigger programs. Now, as part of that, I've also decided to up the number of bytes in the workspace. I'm going to save off seven tracks. That's about 23K, 24K, somewhere in there. What that allows me to do is, of course, have bigger workspaces, but then also have 8K of RAM above the workspace that never gets clobbered when you load new ones. So you can have code up there that then remains as you load at different workspaces. That might be to load a debugger or to load other code that was going to call that. I just figured that might come in very handy. Um, with seven... Uh, tracks per workspace and 77 tracks on this disk. Obviously, we can get 11 workspaces on this. So what we're going to do is just define those as workspaces 0 through 10. Uh, 0 through A, we'll just type in those letters and that will identify the workspace. Alright, so let's go ahead and take a look. And right off the bat, you'll notice one new change that I promised I would do. Notice I typed EDT without the R in parentheses and I still did a re-edit. So I have patched the editor in order to uh, save me having to type the R in parentheses every time. Very simple patch, just change the two jumps in the very init code of the EDT. So now um, to do a new file, you actually have to put an N in parentheses. Um, so very simple patch, and of course with this workspace concept, as soon as I save the workspace, that patch was saved. So that worked out nice. All right, so here's the jump table. We still have loads workspace and save workspace, but in the beginning I've added boot. This is a specialized case of load workspace. It needs to initialize the drive and do some, uh, initialize the serial port that a normal load workspace doesn't have to do. 
also it never aborts back to the monitor when there's a failure or error of any kind because the monitor doesn't exist yet quite possibly. Um, then I've also added these entry points here to allow other programs to use the prompt for disk I.O. For example, I need to write a program to back up these disks and it should be very easy uh, with the I.O. routines in this prompt. So basically you set the drive track sector you want to read, give it an address and memory where you want it to go, and then you can actually issue the read or write. So that will come in handy and um, either later in this video or next video we'll demonstrate um, a backup routine that uses that. All right, um, let's see. No, we're gonna have to watch this whole thing go by. I'm just, oh good, it stopped. All right, so the loops are basically the same as we had before. Uh, we have our, our boot one here and then load and save workspace. This part didn't really change. The main difference is that we've added this get workspace command which will, in the end, determine what track to start writing the workspace from. After that, the transfer routines are the same. So let's take a look at the Git workspace. Two options. One, it can get it from the command line. So when we set up the load and save command like we did last week, I want to be able to just say load one, load three. Um, or if you don't specify it, then it will actually come down here and prompt you to type in a workspace number. Uh, then it converts that workspace number to binary, multiplies it by seven uh, by doing a shift and a few shifts and a subtract, and then that sets the track number. So the get workspace command is what sets the starting track, and then it just transfer tracks, saves seven tracks out to disk, just like we used to save five. Other than that, that part's all the same. The rest of the program is the same. One more time. All right, and here's the external routines. Really, all they're doing is just saving the value you pass for track, sector, address, and drive. Now, when you pass the drive, um, it does nullify the track number field so that it forces the drive to go out and find out what track it's on. So other than that, the rest of this is the same as before. We just have the workspace concept now where we can specify the number. So let's go ahead and assemble it. Now this takes a while, but in the end, we have 430 lines in this program, and I mean it takes about 8 seconds or 10 seconds. It's still far faster than this would actually be on CPM that came along later, because it's all done in RAM. Okay, no undefined symbols are listed, so that all worked. Alright, so I put this program up at um, 6,000 hex, and so um, we can run this by just jumping to those locations. So for example, to save this workspace, I'll jump to, um, so 6,000 hex is 60,000 in octal. This is an easy one. So 60,006 would be the save routine. Now it's asking for a workspace number. This is what is different. So I can save this to say workspace one instead of zero. That way I'm not clobbering my initial one. Now of course this does take a little bit longer, but it's still under four seconds. And then of course the read would be 60,003 and you could load or save either workspace you wanted. All right, so let's, uh, let's create those commands and see if that works with the parameters, our, our load and save commands. So first I want to delete the old ones that we had laid around that point to the run. This is the CLR, the clear command in PS2. So I want to clear load, and I clear save. So now those spots are available to use <coughs> to update. All right, so the beginning address of the load is 6,003 hex, and run, and call it load. All right, now the program is running, but I don't want to let it clobber me. So I'm going to type an invalid workspace number here, which will just abort to the monitor and not do anything. I'll type the letter K, and it says workspace error. That's from our program. So that didn't actually load anything, but it let the programming system put the load command into its program table. So now we'll just do the same thing again for save. And I'll type a workspace of K so we get an error there as well. Alright, so those commands are both in there. So now I want to save workspace 0. And it did it. Uh, no 
might as well save it as one as well. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, do a new. See, now we have nothing there. And so if I save this as workspace two, let's say. So zero and one are identical. You mean you might want to back up like that as you're going along, or if you've done something new, you can save it to a different workspace and then still be able to go back to your older version on a lower workspace. All right, so workspace two has um, a blank edit buffer. So let's load workspace zero. Let's see, we do have the buffer there at zero, but now let's load workspace two. And it's empty, just like we expected. All right, so what we need to do now is put that into prom. And at that point, I think we pretty much have the workspace concept figured out on this. Um, very flexible, we're using the whole disk, nice and fast. Um, in fact, I, I can do everything on this without tapping into the byte stream type of I.O. that the programming system does at all. That is still in there if I needed to write a tape for somebody or if I needed to um, load some old program off of tape, all that's still there. I can create paper tapes or cassettes for other people. And in fact, whatever I develop probably in these early days is going to go out to paper tape or cassette because that's how the software is still distributed. But frankly, to be honest, I did not set off to write a new operating system or a new development system. What I set off to do was to make this thing a usable software development environment me so that I could write whatever it was I wanted to write. Let's say I was working on a full screen editor that I wanted to promote. I don't want to spend my time making this fancier and fancier when it already does a great job. I would say um, I, I've got my solution here and for the original problem I would stop at this point and just start using it for what I wanted. Um, what I think I will do is come back and write the first utility that's probably necessary and that would be a copy routine to back these up. So I'm going to go ahead and do a video cut and then we'll show that copy routine real quick and then um, I think we'll call this project done. I went ahead and changed the assembly address of the routines we've been working on to the prom address of F800. Went ahead and burnt the two proms, it still fits in those two proms, and installed them on the 88 PMC board inside this computer. So now we can boot and see what it's like using our new workspace routines. I examine F800 and hit run, but you notice instead of hitting the disk and booting, it gave us a prompt now for a workspace number. So we can start off on any workspace we want. Uh, workspace 0 is the prompt routines we've been working on. Workspace 1, I just type a 1, it's off and loading, is the backup routine I told you I would write. First program, first thing I've developed underneath this new system. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. All right, so this is a disk copy routine. It's going to back up the disk from drive zero to drive one. First thing I have to do is provide an uh, interface section to the prom, and that's what you see here. It starts at F800, and then all the jump vectors are there. Those will all just, of course, equate to the entry addresses. I went ahead and added three new ones here at the end, a get care, display care, and display a message. Those routines all already existed inside that prom, so I figured I might as well put hooks into there so that utilities I write can easily get to those without having to have whole separate routines for those. All right, so let's take a look at the program. It's pretty short and simple. Basically, we prompt uh, the user to make sure he's ready. And then um, after we got his confirmation, we're good to go. Then it's basically the same loop for loading and saving the workspace. Um, we, we set the track and we read from drive zero and we go to drive one and write the track, display a dot pacifier that people know we're doing something, and then just repeat it until we've done all the tracks. That's pretty much all there is to it. The actual track transfer routine is the same as before, um, where we go every other sector so that uh, interleaving lets us write this in two revolutions. The main difference is that we now call set sector instead of storing it. We call set DMA instead of um, just storing it. And again, we call set drive instead of just storing it. So other than that, it's very, very simple. That's pretty much the whole program. See, so we'll take a look at the rest of it. 
Um, I think you have to have the exact line number to make this work. Yeah, I don't like that one feature. So anyway, here's the whole program. So here's our start, outer loop, track loop, and that's the end. So very simple to write. Um, one thing I have done here, notice that I put the begin and the run statements right in my source file. So this will automatically put this into the table for me and call the program back. So it's gonna run it when we assemble it. All right, so let's exit, assemble it. Oh, it says it's doubly defined, so I must already have it in there. That's what that D means, is it's already defined. So let's see, clear, whoops, clear back, get it out of there. Obviously, I've done this before. Now, interestingly, if you want to reassemble, you have to go back into the editor and exit. That rewinds the file pointer, basically. All right. So now it's actually running the program. I put it in the program table and it run it. I'll just say no here. I'm not ready. So now we can actually use it. So if I ever want to do a backup, um, I have two disks loaded. I just simply load workspace one and type back. It says source and drive zero, destination run. You ready? Yes. And then off it goes. And it, um, it does about eight tenths of a second per track. So a little over, a little over a minute to do this whole thing. So anyway, this is the first program I've gotten to develop in this. It's just to take a step back and you can see it going back and forth between the two disks. See that light coming on down there going back and forth. Uh, this is the first program I got to develop in this new environment. Works just great. Uh, I have it on Workspace ONE. Uh, very easy to load whenever I want to back up. I just load Workspace ONE and type back and then I can back up. One interesting thing here about this hardware, you notice you don't hear the head clicking. This, I'll be quiet for a second. So it's just going back and forth. If you ever had eight inch drives like shoe guards or any of the others, typically in any copy like this, you hear clunk, 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 clunk as it goes back and forth. The hardware on this uh, actually has a single head select line that goes to both drives at the same time, even if the drive is not selected. Um, sort of like on five and a quarter inch drives where the motor control turns on all the drives even if it's not selected. The advantage of that is it makes drive to drive copying a little bit quicker because it doesn't have to wait for head loads or in the case of five and a quarter drives doesn't have to wait for the motor to start each time the only downside of course would be it's a little bit more wear and tear on the drive that's not being used um, but sometimes that trade-off's worth it obviously in the five and a quarter inch world they deem the trade-off worth it because um, that motor online hits all drives every time although the motor on start is a bigger delay than a head load would be all right, so that worked pretty well. Let me go back and show you real quick um, what I did on the, um, the actual program that's in PROM. I'll just load workspace zero, edit it. And here's the jump table that I changed. I basically added jumps to our terminal IO uh, which were already in here for writing the error messages and prompting for the workspace, etc. So that if I read a little utility program, I can just call these rather than having to reinvent the wheel. All right, so I think that does it. I think I'm calling this project complete. I now have a development environment that I can use very quickly and efficiently, and I'm quite happy with. Of course, there's a million things you could do to it to make it fancier and do more. But again, my goal was not to create a development environment and perfect that. My goal was to create a development environment I could use to start writing something. Um, and it's good enough for me to do that. 